So, good afternoon and uh, welcome, everyone. It's great to see such uh, a good uh, attendance. My name's Scott Bryson. Uh, I'm one of the uh, trustees uh, on the board of uh, M&D Scotland. And uh, on behalf of the International Alliance of uh, M&D ALS uh, Associations and M&D Scotland, it's my pleasure to chair this uh, session uh, and facilitate your opportunity to uh, ask the experts. A um, couple of uh, domestic uh, formalities, uh, first of all. We're not expecting a, a fire alarm, um, so if uh, one sounds, then make your way in an orderly fashion. Um, just out uh, the exit doors here, um, going to your left as you're walking uh, to the main uh, doors out onto the uh, patio. Um, toilets are also to the left. Um, there's uh, a supply of water on the... Uh, uh, tables uh, just outside the, uh, the the main door there. So I think these are the uh, the formalities. And uh, experts is the operative uh, word here. And without further ado, perhaps I'll go along the the panel and introduce uh, my colleagues. So uh, closest to me then is uh, Dr. Brian Dickey. Uh, next to Brian is um, Professor Dame Pamela Shaw. Um, then uh, going along the line, um, Dr. Buvanesh uh, Selvaraj. Um, next to him, uh, Dr. Arpan Mehta, and uh, furthest away, Professor Orla Hardiman. So we're really fortunate to have this collective knowledge and experience available to us for the next uh, couple of hours. Um, I've uh, asked uh, each of the experts to present uh, for uh, a maximum of 20 minutes. We're going to try and keep as close to the uh, allotted time schedule as we can. And depending on the timing of the individual presentations, there might be opportunity for you to uh, raise a question or, or a, a point of clarification immediately after each of uh, the individual presentations. But the main Q&A session will be at the end and we'll form uh, back into the panel um, and there'll be 25 minutes uh, or thereabouts uh, at the end uh, for interaction between the audience and the, uh, and the panel uh, members. Um, and before we go any further, um, we should acknowledge that uh, we have the technology to go well beyond these four walls. So um, uh, welcome, uh, especially then, to those of you who are tuning in uh, to the session in various ways from, uh, from further afield. I hope that the connections are loud and clear. Someone will notify me uh, otherwise, I'm sure. Uh, and we'll be able to take your questions and, and comments as well as those from the audience uh, here. So um, I think uh, my introduction is complete unless Craig is going to notify me uh, otherwise. And we've got a busy program um, covering various priorities in improving our understanding of uh, M&D uh, ALS. It's causes, it's care, treatment, uh, and uh, most importantly, I think, research. So if I could invite uh, Dr. Brian Dickey um, to give the, the first uh, presentation and just a, a few words of uh, introduction for, uh, for Brian, um, who uh, graduated with a, a PhD in neuropharmacology from the University of Wales um, College of Medicine. He then took up a research fellowship in the Department of Pharmacology, the University of Oxford, and since 1996-97, uh, um, Brian has worked uh, for the MND Association as Director of Research Development. So we give a, a, a warm welcome to Dr. Brian Dickey, please. Thank you. Um, as you'll guess from my accent, I'm not Welsh. <laughs> Um, in fact, I did my first degree just up the road at Glasgow University and I had a flat with no central heating and very, very large windows just off our Guile Street. Um, oh, I miss that place so much. <laughs> so um, I'm going to just talk a little bit about uh, the causes of MND. Um, just to check you're all awake at the beginning, um, hands up who's seen the film Sliding Doors. Yep, quite a few. Uh, one of my favourite films. Um, for those of you who haven't seen it, it stars Gwyneth Paltrow, and it's basically two films in one. And in the first version of the film, she's running for an underground train in London, and she gets there just before the doors close, gets on the train. Second version of the film, she's running for the train, the doors close just before she gets there. And that one incident sends her life off in two different directions. And it's not unusual when you're given a diagnosis like MND to think, why me? 
Why did I get this disease? And it's often followed by what was the thing that caused this MND. And, you know, if there was a single cause of MND, believe me, we'd have found it a long, long time ago. It's much more complex than just a single sliding doors moment. The analogy I often use is it's maybe more like a, a set of balancing scales, like the scales of justice. And something has to tilt the balance in favour of the disease occurring. And we know that there are many different factors that are involved here, and that's why we call it a multifactorial disease. So rather than just a big weight on the scales, single big weight, it's like lots of grains of sand on the scales. Some of those we will be born with, they are susceptibility genes, the grains of sand are sitting there in the scales, but the scales don't move. So you have to go looking at maybe environmental factors. You know, maybe you were dropped on your head as a baby, it could be a grain of sand. Uh, between the ages of five and uh, ten, you lived in the countryside and Farmer Giles was chucking his DDT over the crops every summer, another grain of sand. You were very sporty and athletic at school, played a lot of rugby, did cross-country running, none of, another grain of sand. You went to university, you did the complete opposite, you drank like a fish, you smoked like a chimney, you didn't get out of bed till two o'clock in the afternoon. I don't know, maybe that was just me, actually. <laughs> but the point is that it could be this accumulation of different unrelated, apparently unrelated and innocuous things that eventually tilt the balance in favour of the disease occurring. And we have to add to that ageing. Uh, we have an ageing nervous system. The older you are, the more likely you are to develop MND. And that's probably linked to the fact that the body is less able to cope with whatever is loading up that side of the scales. But I'm going to focus mainly on the genetics today. But um, you'll notice that there is another side of the scales as well. And one of the most common questions I'm asked is, Stephen Hawking, how come he lived for over 50 years with this disease? This is my favourite photograph of Professor Hawking, you know, not a wheelchair in sight. You know, this was somebody who um, didn't let the disease define him. Um, and he asked me that question himself one time, and I found myself going, imagine a set of balancing scales, whereas in my head I was just thinking, I'm talking to Stephen Hawking, I'm talking to Stephen Hawking. <laughs> but, you know, maybe, as I said to him, there was something in his genetic makeup that hadn't stopped the disease, but was pushing back just a bit and slowing the progression. And so there's now increasing interest on that side of the scales as well. Because if we can identify, let's call them good genes that slow the disease down in some individuals and work out what they're doing, maybe you can develop a drug that acts as a bigger weight on that side of the scales and would be effective in all forms of the disease. So before I delve into um, genetics in too much detail, I'm going to give you a very simple example of how genes and environment come together to cause an effect. So hands up again, have anybody who's ever heard that the Japanese can't hold their drink? Yeah, one or two, <laughs> one or two, not too many. Well, it's actually not a myth. It is true. Um, a large proportion of the population of Japan are not very good at holding their alcohol. And the reason for that is because about 50% of the population of Japan carries a mutation in a particular gene. It's called the ADH gene. And ADH stands for alcohol dehydrogenase. And as the name suggests, amongst other things it does in the body, it's a liver enzyme. It breaks down alcohol. So in these people, the the genetic code, the genetic instructions to make this enzyme in the liver are slightly wrong. So the enzyme is put together wrong and it doesn't do its job properly. And as a result, you have a drink, your blood alcohol levels rise, but they don't go down as quickly in these people. So they have another drink, they get higher, they have another drink, they get higher. I think it's no coincidence that the Japanese invented karaoke. Because <laughs> let's face it, you do have to have a certain amount of alcohol in you before you think that picking up that microphone is a good idea. <laughs> um, but there is a very simple example. One genetic factor, one the ADH gene, one environmental factor, al alcohol. And of course, it's not just a case of, you know, you get drunk, you stand up, you sing badly, and you fall over. Um, the 50% of the population with this gene mutation does have long-term health problems as well, particularly heart disease and liver disease. But there we have single gene change, single environmental factor causing an effect. MND, much more complex than that. As I said, many, many grains of sand. So one question is, well, 
you know, can we get an idea of what the, the proportion of genetic factors to environmental factors are in MND? Quite difficult to do, but one of the ways you can do that is through what are called twin studies. Now, twins are pretty rare. Um, MND is pretty rare, so the one study that's been done does carry a, a, what we call large error, margins of error. But basically what you do is you take identical twins, and um, identical twins, of course, share 100% of their DNA, and you also take non-identical twins who share 50% of their DNA. And if the first twin has a disease like MND, you ask the question, how often does the disease then appear in the second twin? And if there's a difference, if it occurs more often in the identical twins than the non-identical twins, it gives you a rough idea of what the proportion of genes to environment is. I hope that made sense. The bottom line is that this study that was done by a group in uh, London showed that the breakdown appeared to be about 60% down to your genes, 40% down to environmental factors. Another way of looking at it um, that researchers have looked at it is how many steps would it take to develop MND? And um, this is uh, uh, an approach that's been used in cancer quite a lot, um, but up until a few years ago had never been used outside of cancer. But uh, a neurologist, uh, Amar al Chalabi, uh, along with an epidemiologist from London, Neil Pierce, and some of the, um, the panel sitting uh, beside me today um, were involved in this study. And they took this formula that had been used in cancer, because of course many cancers involve genetic predisposition and exposure to environmental factors. That's the formula up there in the top right. Um, don't ask me to explain it. I remember when Professor Al Chalabi, we were sitting in a coffee shop and he's scribbling this on a napkin and he's going, it's really, really easy. And I'm just thinking, nod and smile, Brian, nod and smile. <laughs> but um, they took this formula and they applied it to uh, a register of people with MND in the southeast of England. And what they found is when you took the logarithm of the age at which people develop the disease against the incidence, how many people at that age were developing the disease, what you found was everything seemed to line up in a straight line. Um, so they said, well, okay, that's interesting. Uh, let's go to Scotland because uh, there's a very nice MND register running in Scotland. And they saw exactly the same thing. And in Ireland and in Holland and in Italy, exactly the same line. And a straight line like that means that, and the slope of that line actually tells you how many steps are involved, how many grains of sand potentially have to load up one side of the scale. And in sporadic MND, it seems to be six steps. Now, just in case you think, well, if you do that for any disease, you get a straight line, um, you can see multiple sclerosis there by comparison. There's no line whatsoever. So we think that there are six factors, events, have to occur. Um, the problem is we don't know what they are. Um, there's been a lot of work done, a lot of epidemiology done on trying to identify environmental factors for MND. Uh, when I first joined the MND Association, we'd completed a piece of work where something like 800 people with MND had completed a 47-page questionnaire asking them about every aspect of their lifestyle, every question we could think about. Um, and all of that information was fed into a computer at uh, Brunel University, and we came out with one positive correlation, which was the older you are, the more likely you are to develop MND. So it's clearly not as simple as just asking a question and the answer arising. But I'm going to give you one example here, um, one which has been shown to be quite consistent as a risk factor for MND, and that's smoking. And a ring fence where MND appears on the list of things that smoking might cause. And you can see it's about number 20 in that list. There's a vertical line there, and you see all these dots and blobs. Anything to the right of that vertical line is an increase in risk. So you can see that for MND, smoking is a small it's a consistent, but it's a very small increase in risk. Go right up to the top of the list, lung disease, lung cancer, and you're right off the edge of the screen there. 
So you have to take these things in proportion. You know, I think all this slide really tells us is, A, smoking is not a cause of MND. It might be a very, very tiny grain of sand on that side of the scales, whereas for lung disease, of course, smoking is a large weight on that side of the scales. So I'm going to spend more time talking about uh, the genetic side because, um, you know, this sort of work, trying to identify causes of MND, is a bit like looking for a needle in a haystack. But with the genetic side, we know the size of the haystack. It's these three billion base, uh, base pairs, six billion letters of genetic code that we find in every cell in our body. Um, so we know the size of the haystack, and there's certain things we can do, maybe to try and reduce the search. For example, can we identify where in the haystack the needles might be? And if we can find those, can we pull them out so we can examine them to see whether they're needles or not? And that's basically the approach that's being taken, thanks to some amazing advances in uh, gene hunting technology. So you go into a genetic research lab. This is the, the Sanger Institute uh, in Cambridge. And you don't see any Bunsen burners or test tubes. You see these rather large machines that are just um, churning out genetic code from uh, DNA samples. And you also need um, some pretty large computers, a single human genome will clog up the hard drive of your uh, laptop. Um, so when you're looking at thousands, tens of thousands, even more, you need some pretty big toys. This is the Surf Sarah um, computer in Holland, which is being used, amongst other things, for, um, well, one of the other things is actually it's used by the European Space Agency for mapping galaxies, but it's also being used for a big international MND gene hunting project called Project Mine. And I want to tell you a little bit about Project Mine um, and about these two gentlemen, Bernard Muller and Robert Jan Stewart, who were both um, Dutch entrepreneurs who were both diagnosed with MND about the same time. And uh, the story, as Bernard tells it to me, is that they went to their local care and research centre, which was the University of Utrecht, and they were being shown around the labs and they were shown into this room where there was this big freezer. And the freezer was full of uh, DNA samples. And Bernard said, so, um, so what are these for then? And he was told, oh, um, not for anything at the moment. These are for later. Um, you know, it's very complex stuff and we can't afford to do it. And uh, he said, so a lot of the answers to our disease are lying in this freezer. Yeah, yeah, and quite a few other freezers around the world. Well, shouldn't we be doing something about it then? And out of that, Project Mine was born, and um, it now involves 19 countries around the world. I think it's a great example of, of crowdfunding. Um, they've set themselves a very ambitious target of uh, sequencing the genetic code of 22,500 people, 15,000 people with motor neuron disease, 7,500 people who don't have motor neuron disease, because, of course, you've got to compare the genetic makeup of somebody with the disease to somebody that doesn't have the disease. Um, we came in very early, uh, at a very early stage. Uh, we had a target of about almost 10% of that international target, and we're just about to finish that. And you'll see that graph on the right. I'm not going to go into that in any detail. Um, just see the line that's kind of rising very rapidly. That shows the number of genes that have been identified since the first key breakthrough was made back in 1993. And it, basically, it's rising exponentially. We're finding new genes you know, almost on a, a quarterly, monthly basis even. So we're really starting to um, get the pieces of the jigsaw that will be necessary to understand what's driving this disease in the first place. However, that's really focusing on what we call sporadic MND. You know, it pops up here, there for reasons we still don't completely understand. But of course, as many of you know, sometimes the disease does run in families. In 5 to 10% of cases, there's a strong family history of the disease. And in that case, there must be a genetic factor that's acting more like a larger weight on the scales if it's being passed down through the family line. But you'll see there, I haven't said familial MND is a genetic disease. I've said it's a mainly genetic disease and added a question mark because it could still be very variable. Other grains of sand could be required. 
So some researchers um, just a couple of years ago thought, well, OK, let's take that mathematical model that we used for sporadic MND, and let's see what happens if we apply it just to people with specific genetic mutations and a family history of the disease. And what they found, they looked at three particular genes, um, c 9 r 72 which accounts for about probably a third of all familial MND cases, SOD1, which accounts for about 20% of uh, all MND cases, and one called uh, TARDBP or TDP43, accounts for maybe 3 4% of all cases. But what they found was, once again, they got straight lines occurring. And the slope of those lines tells you how many steps are involved. And you can see that there's three steps for C9, uh, four for TDP43, and two for SOD1. So it's fewer than six steps. So the genetic factor is a kind of bigger grain of sand, a bigger weight. But it's more than one. There are other things that still need to occur. And um, that explains, you know, for example, in a family with a SOD1 mutation, why one family member may develop the disease in their 30s and it progresses very quickly, but another family member may develop the disease in their 60s and it progresses more slowly, or a third family member may carry the gene and not develop the disease at all. So it's not just down to the um, genes alone, or at least those specific genes alone. So I've told you a lot about genetics, you know, I guess one of the questions is, well, is this all an academic exercise? You know, what does this mean in the real world and how is this going to help us to develop effective treatments for this disease? So one of the ways is that if you've got something that is priming the disease, a fairly large weight on one side of the scales, like these hereditary genes, then we can actually take that knowledge, go into the laboratory, and try and develop laboratory models. Now, you can take the, the kind of deconstructionist approach, break everything down into its individual little parts, or you could look at the organism as a whole. There's no ideal laboratory model here. Each one has its pros, its cons, and each one is better for particular types of research. But we have a whole range of these. So from um, cells grown in a dish in isolation, and you're going to hear more about that from a couple of our speakers later on, to very single, uh, simple organisms like these nematode worms. Fruit flies are very popular with uh, many researchers. You move from invertebrates to vertebrates, so zebrafish now have a rudimentary spinal cord, so you're getting closer to the human situation, to the rat and the mouse models as well. Um, but, you know, having that starting point, uh, a genetic factor that is really driving the disease in some cases, allows you to actually develop similar models in the lab and actually find out what's going on, particularly at the very early stages of the disease. Because, you know, if we want to develop effective treatments for this disease, chances are we are going to have to try and catch it quicker in future. Um, another example is, of course, now, um, particularly if there's a family history of the disease, younger family members might think about taking a genetic test themselves. This happens in Huntington's disease and breast cancer. And particularly if they want to start a family themselves, they want the, you know, the, the reassurance that even if they carry the gene, they won't pass it on to their children. So now you can apply for a process called pre-implantation genetic uh, diagnosis uh, to the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority. And basically, this is an in vitro fertilization um, process. But of course, there's no fertility problems here, so it usually only needs one, one attempt. And you take sperm from the father, egg from the mother, um, fertilize them. And when the embryos get to this kind of eight-cell little ball stage, you can pinch off a cell, it doesn't harm the embryo, and you test that cell to see if it carries the faulty gene. And of course, if it does, you set that aside. If it doesn't, then you implant that embryo into the mother. And uh, the first um, time this process was used was probably about six years ago now, I think, um, in the UK, specifically for motor neuron disease. And I love this quote, which I pinched off of uh, the website at uh, 
King's College Hospital. Uh, it's from the mother of uh, the, the, the child that was conceived. Our son was the first child in the UK conceived through PGD for motor neuron disease. He's brought a lot of joy to the whole family. It's just amazing to know that he's okay and he won't go through this horrible illness. It's a blessing to know that for our family, this illness stops with this generation. And that still sends shivers down my spine. You know, the fact that we have so few victories at the moment against this disease that I think we need to celebrate um, opportunities like this. And, um, you know, as we discover more genes, clearly that gives more opportunity, at least for a process like pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. And then I think the really exciting stuff that's really just coming over the horizon, which Professor Shaw is going to uh, talk more about, is that if we have got bad genes that are doing bad things, can we remove that weight? Can we switch off these genes? And I'm not going to say any more about that, apart from its approach at the moment, which uh, is called antisense um, uh, therapy. And it's being trialled at the moment for the SOD1 forms of MND, and hopefully um, not too far into next year, we might have it trialled for the C9 or 72 form of uh, the disease as well. And, oh, there we go. And, um, you know, there's a lot of hope behind this technology, and um, that hope comes from a childhood motor neuron disease uh, called spinal muscular atrophy, where we've seen some quite dramatic um, improvements in treatment recently. And I just pulled this. This came from The Guardian um, about a year ago, um, where, you know, for, I think, for many, many years, we've been thinking this, you know, this is too tough a nut to crack. Suddenly, this breakthrough in another type of motor neuron disease does have its differences, but is really, I think, galvanizing um, a lot of excitement that we might actually be able to make inroads into treating other forms of MND and also, indeed, other neurodegenerative diseases, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, etc. Um, this is my last slide. Um, you know, I spend a lot of time talking about advances in research, and um, it's, <laughs> it's complex stuff, it has to be said. Um, the media like to um, distill everything down to, you know, problem, solution. I call it the rule of Star Trek. If you ever watch Star Trek, in the last five minutes of the program, somebody goes, I know, let's reverse the dilithium flow through the phase energizer, Captain. <laughs> It's always better in a Scottish accent as well. <laughs> and uh, make it so, and in the last five seconds of the programme, the um, ship saved from blowing up. You know, if only it were that simple. It is a far more complex problem. But I do believe that we are starting to move more in the right direction, um, maybe taking more steps forward than we are taking backward. So I hope I've more or less kept to time. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Brian. Bang on time, in fact. Um, that's a really helpful uh, introduction to the session. And I think uh, in light of the time pressures, we should move just uh, quickly on. Unless there's any immediate uh, concerns or, or points of clarification for, for Brian. There is, there is one. I can take one uh, from the front row. And there are roving microphones, I think. So just if you could wait for the microphone and then everybody will hear the, uh, the question. This gentleman on the front row here. Thank you. Hi, Brian. Yeah, it's on. Hi, Brian. I've been listening intently. I felt obviously I didn't understand. But uh, I, my name's William. I suffer from motor neuron. <laughs> I, in background, I've been looking at everything. In the last 30 years, charities, uh, individuals have been throwing millions of pounds into motor neuron, hoping for a discovery, uh, some sort of treatment. <laughs> the disappointing thing is, Brian, in the last 30 years, there's not been as much as a paracetamol been discovered. Oh, I, guess, I mean, there's been a lot of false hope to people who suffer from motor neuron. Mm. But at the end of it, there's still not even an aspirin on the market for motor neuron. I, I think some of that will be covered by the other panel members. But uh, yeah, I mean, I came into this field just over 20 years ago. And uh, in fact, Rilizol 
was just being licensed for MND. And I think some of us, maybe it was naivety, but I thought, uh, yeah, this will be the first of many and we'll build on that, we'll build on that. To be honest, I think, I think we got lucky with Rilazole. And although it's not a wonder drug, it was that first uh, step. Um, what we've found is if we, as we've learned more about this disease, we've just learned how complex it is. And that's not just, uh, of course, in motor neuron disease. You know, you said millions have been put into MND. Billions, tens of billions have been put into Alzheimer's disease. And yet in treatment terms, we're actually still further ahead than they are. Um, so, you know, these diseases are tough nuts to crack. Is it because uh, it's the private pharmaceutical companies who decide what discoveries and treatments go on the market? That's in part um, true because, of course, the market drives everything. You know, drug companies are interested in uh, making profits for their shareholders. Um, however, uh, we have the International Symposium in Glasgow this year. Last year, we had it in Boston. Now, Boston is the heartland of the U.S. Um, pharmaceutical and biotechnology sector. And we had so many drug company guys wandering around the place. Now, the reason they are there is because they think there's a market. They think they can develop something that they can sell. And I see that as a positive. You know, the fact that they're interested in MND is a good thing, because if we are going to crack this disease, it's got to be done with the pharmaceutical companies. Yeah. But that challenge is it's a rare disease. So it's always going to be a limited market. But I think if you can crack MND, you can crack Alzheimer's, you can crack Parkinson's, and that's the route into the, you know, the billion dollar industries. Okay, thank you, Brian. And um, thank you for your questions. Those were bang on and uh, set the foundation, I think, for the, the presentations that will follow. Um, so uh, next up is uh, Professor Dame Pamela Shaw. Uh, and I'll uh, just give a few words of, of introduction for, for Pam. Uh, she's Professor of Neurology at the University of Sheffield and Director of the Sheffield MND Centre. She's also Director of the Sheffield Institute of Translational Neuroscience. And I was interested to uh, learn in the uh, details I have that uh, for the last eight years, uh, Pam has led the Clinical Studies Group for uh, ALS MND uh, within the National Institute for Health Research. Um, and this is the Dementia and Neurodegenerative uh, Diseases Clinical Research Network, which uh, spans 19 care and research uh, centres um, and has developed a network of 10 centres in the UK. So it would seem to me with a framework like that, we've got a fighting chance of responding to the, the challenge that uh, was raised from the front row. So thank you very much, uh, Pam. So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure and honour um, to be here to speak to you this afternoon. And Craig asked me to talk about current key developments in MND research and looking a little bit to the future. Does this? So every Scottish friend and person I know uh, when they meet somebody new, they always want to know where you're from. So this is where I'm from. Uh, I don't think that works on the screen. So the red blob there is, is South Yorkshire, and I, uh, I'm from Northumberland, not far from the Scottish border, um, but I work in Sheffield, and I live in the Hope Valley in Derbyshire, uh, a nice name, Hope Valley, for somebody who works on motor neuron disease, I think. Um, and this is um, the, the Sheffield Institute for Translational Neuroscience, um, where more than 200 people now beaver away from dawn to midday to midnight, um, trying to understand more about what causes the injury to motor neurons in MND. And what we try to do in CITRAM, um, and the, the inspiration from it, for it came from a patient. Uh, a lady said to me, if you had 20 million pounds to spend on motor neuron disease research, what would you do? And what, I thought it was a joke, but I actually described CITRAM. 
<clears throat> and what we have in Citran is doc clinical doctors and scientists working on MND together, keeping each other right, and we're trying to harness all the exciting discoveries in neuroscience and translate those scientific insights into benefits for the patients that we see in the clinic. And when we think about the treatment of motor neuron disease, of course, what we all want is neuroprotective treatments, so treatments that protect those precious motor neurons and stop um, the downstream muscle wasting and weakness that happens. But there are other important aspects to treatment, so good quality clinical care is very important, and good management of some of the symptoms that might happen is also very important. So what I'm going to cover in the next few minutes uh, is this. So I'm just going to introduce you to um, what mo motor neurons are. As a medical student, I was absolutely fascinated by them. I thought they were by far the most interesting and elegant cells in the body. I'm going to expand a little on what um, uh, Brian has said, just why it's so difficult to get those treatments that we desperately want. And one of the things we've got to do is break MND down into its subtypes. All the clinical trials so far have tended to treat it as though it's one thing. And we know now from genetics and other work that it isn't one thing. I'm going to talk a little bit about gene therapy, which I think is really, really exciting. And I'm going to talk a little bit at, at the end about while we're waiting patiently and desperately for better neuroprotective treatments, um, we can do a lot with high quality symptomatic care. So in our bodies, we have this beautiful network shown by the green uh, fibers here of motor neurons. They are the biggest cells in the body. So um, the cell body supplying a lower leg muscle might sit in the lower spine, and this axon, this connection from the cell body to the muscle might be a meter long. So uh, that cell sits in your spine, a meter long axon going down to the muscles in your lower leg, and within that axon there's a railway system of cargoes going up and down. So amazing cells with amazing properties. And I'm just going to show you a cartoon of what motor neurons do. So here's the motor neuron cell body sitting in the spine. When you want to move a muscle, the motor neurons fired into activity by a chemical messenger called glutamate. So glutamate attaches onto these little receptors and fires the motor neuron into activity. That allows lots of calcium and sodium ions to get inside the cell. Very important that that excitatory signal is removed quickly. You don't want the cell to be overstimulated. And then once that signal has happened, the motor neuron literally sends an electrical message right down the axon, this big long fiber that I showed you. It travels all the way down. You can see the railway system within the motor neuron. That electrical message goes right down to the nerve terminus. And when it gets there, it causes another chemical to be released, which attaches onto the muscle. And that's what makes your muscle contract. So imagine all the movements we do in a day, and that's what's going on to allow our brain to control our muscles and therefore our movements. So why is um, the treatment um, so difficult to um, bring through for patients? Well, it's because, in a nutshell, MND is not one thing. And it's heterogeneous. It means it's, it's made of a mixture of things both clinically, genetically, pathologically, and prognostically, so the way the disease behaves. So we know that some people get classical ALS, some people have predominantly the upper or lower motor neurons affected, some people the condition starts 
in the speech and swallowing muscles, sometimes the arms, sometimes the legs. Um, so even for a clinician like a neurologist, it, it's not the same thing when the, the patient first presents. We now know at least 30 genes that uh, can predispose um, to MND. As Brian mentioned, the first one that we found was SOD1, copper zinc superoxide dismutase, back in 1993, uh, and new genes are being discovered all the time. The biggest one, the, the most important cause of MND is shown in the big yellow bubble, c 9 orf 72 that Brian talked about. But those are all different genes, and somebody with a SOD1 mutation doesn't behave the same as somebody with a C9 mutation. So it's genetically heterogeneous. Mostly, this is a normal motor neuron, and there's a protein called TDP43 that normally sits in the nucleus of the cell. And when the motor neuron is becoming injured, it, that protein moves out of the nucleus and forms into these skein-like or compact clumps within the cell. Mostly, that's what happens in MND, but not always. Patients with a SOD1 mutation don't have that pathological change, so it's pathologically heterogeneous. We know from what Brian said that the speed of progression can be enormously variable. So Lou Gehrig, the Yankee baseball player, had typically fairly rapidly progressive MND, but Stephen Hawking kept it at bay for more than 50 years. And as Brian said, if we could understand how some people can, their own chemistry, their own genes can slow the disease down, that would be very helpful to us in terms of developing therapies. And if we take just one of those genes, the SOD1 gene, the first one that was found, what we've learned over the last 20 years or more is that you'd think we would have solved SOD1 disease by now, and the reason we haven't is because lots of things go wrong when one building block of SOD1 is changed. At least a dozen types of things, both in the motor neurons and in the neighborhood cells, um, develop problems. And the one drug we have, Rilluzol, tackles only one of those 12 problems, perhaps not surprising then that the effect is more modest than we would like. So in order to improve the situation, we either need a cocktail of drugs or one drug that has multiple effects, or we need to go right upstream of the faulty gene and do something about that and stop that damaging cascade from happening. And that's the excitement of gene therapy, which I'll uh, tell you about in a minute. So subclassifying MND better. So we know we can take 30 different genes and begin to divide patients up. Um, and I'll just um, show you a little bit more about the beginnings of, of how we can use that subclassification to think about a personalized medicine approach. And if you think about breast cancer, new therapies for breast cancer, Herceptin, if you tested that in a 1,000 ladies with breast cancer, it wouldn't show any effect. But if you target that drug to the right subtype of breast cancer patient, then it's a, it's a wonder drug. It has a very good effect. So we need precision medicine uh, for MND. I, I won't go into all the components of that in the interests of time, but one very interesting thing, which you'll hear more about from uh, others on the podium, is being able to take a little snip, tiny little snip of skin cells from a patient. In the laboratory, you can then reprogram those cells to become motor neurons or to become the neighborhood cells that sit around the motor neurons, star-shaped cells called astrocytes. So for the first time, we can actually study the condition in the laboratory from an individual patient in the dish. If, you've got, if you're a skin doctor, you can take a bit of the eczema or psoriasis, take it out and study it in the lab. But of course, we can't do that to the nervous system. We can't take bits of brain or spinal cord in a living person. But this way, we can actually study those precious cells in the laboratory 
and we can reprogram them to become motor neurons, other types of neurons, or the neighborhood cells. And if you take skin from patients, and if you make, uh, reprogram it into these <coughs> astrocytes, neighborhood cells, and grow those astrocytes in a dish, and then put motor neurons on top of them, astrocytes from normal control, shown in the blue bars, normal control people, support the survival of motor neurons. But astrocytes from motor neuron disease patients actually damage and kill the motor neurons. And that's the case. So in green are C9 patients. In, in pink, if I can see it from here, are sporadic patients. And in maroon are patients with SOD1 um, disease. And the reason that's important, so the blue are control cells. So the, the motor neurons there survive very well. The, the motor neurons um, from the different groups of MND patients have a much lower bar, so m many fewer cells survive. But then when you try different neuroprotective treatments, you can get the survival of those motor neurons up towards the control. But the important thing is that different drugs, and here we just tried antioxidant drugs, so andrographolide worked very well for patients with C9 mutations. Um, S-apomorphine worked very well for people with SOD1 mutations. And people with sporadic disease had a variety of responses to those different drugs. So that may enable us to actually see which drugs are, wi are right for which patients. So let me talk a little bit about gene therapy. So if we take SOD1... Excuse that me, I'm sorry to interrupt you. you the more you look there, the better you see. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. Is that better? So, sorry, I'm moving towards the screen. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. So if we think about SOD1, the first gene that was found, and gene therapy, go right, forget about all this damage that's going on, but go right upstream and try and knock down uh, the effect of that rogue gene. And we know you can do that in rodents, in mice, without any harmful effects. And Mimoun Azuz, who works in, in Sheffield, um, did gene therapy trials in a mouse model of SOD1 MND uh, quite a long time ago now, and he found a huge effect from knocking down. So these are survival curves, life expectancy curves. He found a huge positive effect from knocking down that rogue gene. Um, but the way he did it was injecting into lots of muscles, and that's not a very easy thing to do in human beings. But, but gene therapy's now moved on. We now have these carriers, adeno-associated virus type 9, uh, that is a virus from which all the harmful uh, properties have been removed. You can inject it, and it gets into the nervous system. So uh, this is... Uh, an AAV9 viral vector in a large animal, um, and when you inject it via lumbar puncture, it gets into all the different cell types in both the brain and the spinal cord. So good proof of concept. So if we go back to the mouse model, try and knock down that rogue gene, and you, again, I won't go through all these slides in the interest of time, but lots, the, so the treated mice are in red, the red lines, and their motor function, their life expectancy, they get no neurological distress compared to the control mice in, in blue. So very promising uh, looking um, uh, outcome measures from knocking down that rogue gene. And here is a brother and sister. One of the mice has had the treatment, the, the mouse that's running around pretty normally and the sibling uh, is the control mice with SOD1 MND who hasn't had the treatment. And this is at 144 days of age. So dramatic treatment effects. And a similar approach, this, this is not using viral vectors now, but another way of knocking down the rogue gene. There was, there was a human study published a few years ago which showed you could inject into the spinal fluid, knock down that gene with, with good safety, but it wasn't a powerful enough drug. So they went back to the drawing board. They've um, 
now got uh, a more powerful anti-sense drug, and that trial is, has been happening for the last two years. We should have the outcome in a few months' time. It's uh, supported by a pharma company in the US called Biogen. Um, so it involves, and I'm going to show you the first person in the UK who went into this trial, Les. I'm, uh, Les Wood. Les is on to a winner today. <laughs> I'm 63. Can you hear that? I'm 58 because of the inherited form of multi-neural disease. Horses are a big part of my life now. And that's why we bought these small shares in them. It was a way of an alternative to do things together. Les has always wanted to do trials. We've considered every single thing. He's given bloods, he's given pieces of skin, spinal fluids. I'm now involved in this particular trial. In fact, I'm the first one in the UK to be part of it. And I have actually completed the five drug doses that you get. Les is pioneer, you know, the, the commitment for involved for a clinical trial like this is significant. What we want to do is see patient benefit and the clinical trials, are, they're at the coal face of seeing that really. We're trying the, the, the best therapies that the scientific world has produced and seeing if they actually work. I know that this trial is not a cure. I was under no illusions. What I was told is it might help you, it might not, but it might help people in the future. With it being a genetic disease, people in the future, I look at as my family. I feel as though it's helping me a little bit, whether it's just to be mine or not. Who knows, you know, that's why they have placebos, I suppose. But uh, I feel in my own way that I'm getting a little bit stronger in myself. So he's walking up the garden how, steps. You know, what's happened to Les, his improvements, it's been really exciting for the whole team. Obviously we don't know if he's on placebo or the drug, it's one of these things with clinical trials, it's a very difficult place to be. Les. So, big guns treatment, it involves giving the treatment via a lumbar puncture, but, and, and we don't know if Les was on the active treatment or placebo group, um, but he's noticed improvement. He's walking up the garden steps, which he hadn't been able to do for three years. Um, similarly, there's a childhood form of motor neuron disease that Brian mentioned called spinal muscular atrophy. Um, this time, there's a missing protein. So the gene fault actually causes a missing protein, the SMN protein. And if you replace that missing protein with gene therapy in, in the mouse model, again, a dramatic effect. And the first human trials using two different gene therapy approaches, one of which is the AAV9 uh, virus vector that I showed you before, um, published in the New England Journal of Medicine about a year ago. And here's uh, a little child with SMA. Um, that little child would have died within the first two years of life without this gene therapy. Oh, you're doing it. He would have been paralyzed from an early few months of age. Use your arms. Push up. Push up. Come, push, baby. Push, baby. Yeah! So he's sitting up. And he's actually able to stand and, and move his arms, whereas he would have... Um, all by yourself. Reach the end of life without that gene therapy. So, um, just in the last slide or two, um, so we've thought about neuroprotective treatment, why it's difficult, but good clinical care um, improves life expectancy. So, just coming under the care of people expert about MND. Um, does more for life expectancy and quality of life than Rilizol does, actually, and that has been shown at multiple clinics around the world. And what we've done in Sheffield and many other groups are also doing um, is to take the troublesome symptoms one by one and try and do better, try and do something more about them. And we started with difficulty with breathing muscles but have moved on um, to many other different types of symptoms. And I'll just, in the last minute, show you one example. So one of the things my patients told me is when neck muscles get weak, 
it's really uncomfortable. Your head's dropping down. You can't eat properly. You can't look people in the eye when you're talking to them. And it's really painful and uncomfortable. And your head is surprisingly heavy. It weighs about five kilograms. And existing collars aren't comfortable for patients with MND. They're used to immobilize the neck after a car accident, or they're soft, floppy things that don't give much support. So um, we had a, uh, and Chris McDermott from Sheffield led this project. We brought together a multidisciplinary group that involved patients, family members, physiotherapists, neurologists, specialist nurses, biomaterial engineers, um, engineers of di various different sorts, um, and the patients told us what they wanted and helped us design it, and once it was designed, they helped us refine it. And the engineers uh, made sure we used the right materials and, uh, and designed the thing properly, um, and we ended up with this um, cosmetically acceptable, comfortable, adaptable collar uh, that is now marketed worldwide, known as the head-up collar. So very important to pay attention as well to things like that. Um, so coming from the Hope Valley, I do think um, there are rays of hope. I think we're teetering. It, to me, it feels like um, the early days of treating infectious diseases. It's not that many years ago where people would die at a young age of tuberculosis, pneumonia, meningitis, and then we started to get antibiotic treatment. So I think we are on the edge of uh, a new era which will be much more positive. But I'm very aware that the pace of science for people living with the disease and their friends and families, the pace of science seems very uh, painfully slow, and I'm sorry for that. But I think you'll see from this meeting in Glasgow that there are many very dedicated people, both scientists and clinicians from around the world, that are pulling teams together to do their very best uh, to make good progress. And I think the pace of change is going to happen now. So thank you very much for inviting me. Um, you can see from this slide that I wish Brexit wasn't on our horizon. <laughs> I very much wish we were staying within Europe. Thank you for your attention. I'm not sure we've got time to debate the pros and cons of Brexit uh, here and now, but uh, perhaps if there's uh, uh, one or two quick questions for Pam. Um, There's a fascinating presentation there and inspirational stuff. Lots of optimism, I think. Um, would anybody like to uh, uh, raise a point just now? Yes, the gentleman um, in the uh, back row there. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Uh, about... Uh in uh, therapy, uh, that patient, is he getting like every month or how is the protocol? Le Les, who is getting the, the SOD1 right. antisense therapy. Yeah, yes, so, so there are um, the two gene therapy approaches that I touched upon have their pros and cons and differences. So if you use a viral vector, the AAV9, one injection is going to be very long lasting. So it lasts a long, long time. With the antisense oligonucleotide um, injection, the, the uh, effects are shorter lived. So they were having a lumbar puncture every month during the trial. But if the trial was effective, there are ways you can, you can put what's called an Amaya reservoir. You can put a, a device into the cerebrospinal fluid to avoid having to have a lumbar puncture every month. So I think if the experiment works, there, there are ways of making the practical delivery a bit better. So the antisense short-lived effects, the gene therapy with viral vectors, mu a much longer effect. Okay, thank you very much for your question. Uh, I think you, you have a follow-up, a quick follow-up there. Sure, go ahead. Uh, how long is the viral one? 
a long time. So, so in the mice, it, it can last for months and years, but we haven't, um, and, and it's been, the AAV9 viral vector has been used in human studies, but only relatively recently. So we haven't followed up patients for 10 years um, after that, but uh, certainly from the, the animal studies, it seems to be a long time, a good number of months at the very least. Thank you very much, uh, Pam. There'll be plenty of uh, opportunity for further questions in the uh, in the panel session. So I think we should move uh, swiftly on um, uh, to the uh, next uh, presentation. We've got a double act here. Um, so if I could uh, uh, briefly introduce, uh, firstly, Dr. Bhuvanesh uh, Silvaraj, um, who's a postdoctoral researcher at uh, the Ewan McDonald Centre, University of Edinburgh. Most recently, he's led uh, some research investigating one of the commonest, uh, commonest uh, mutations in ELS, I think uh, highlighted in the earlier presentations. And this has led to a high impact uh, publication in Nature Communications earlier this year. So congratulations on your success there. Uh, I think uh, Bhuvanesh is uh, going to lead off and he'll pass the baton to Dr. Arpan uh, Mehta, um, who graduated in medicine from the universities of Oxford and Cambridge. He's currently undertaking uh, his PhD at the Unrolling uh, Regenerative uh, Neurology Clinic in uh, Edinburgh. And his research is funded uh, uh, by, amongst others, the MRC and the MND Association. So thanks to you both um, for your presentation. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, uh, so I'm Bhuvnesh Selvaraj, and along with my colleague Arpan Mehta, what we are going to do today is going to give a little bit more uh, uh, insights into how stem cells as such can be used in the, you know, in motor neuron disease. So we are part of a, a large group of research organization called Ian McDonald Center, which uh, there are about 200 research organiza uh, researchers along with Androlling Clinic, who are mostly un, uh, widespread across Scotland. We are mostly interested in working on the motor neuron disease and bringing benefits to the uh, patients. So, as everyone knows, there's a problem as such. I'm not going to explain more about the motor neuron disease as it's been explained very well by Brian Dickey and uh, Pam Shaw. So I'm just going to tell about the, the problems what, what we, we all know actually. So the neurodegenerative diseases as an umbrella contains quite a lot of like Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, ALS, uh, motor neuron disease, they all are progressive and uh, debilitating disorders. And this is caused by, the, as, as you know, loss of neurons and the supporting cells of the brain, which are the astrocytes, or the, we call it the glial cells. It's, it's, it, the, the, it, it is terrible and very devastating disease, and the prognosis, as you all know, is very poor. And the worst of all is we don't have any more uh, effective disease-modifying treatments. And if you rank uh, a, a list of uh, uh, illness uh, which, uh, which uh, succumbs to death and, 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 and for that which we don't have any more cure uh, or any more treatment, all these neurodegenerative diseases, what I said before, are ranking in the top 10. So that tells something. Uh, there's quite a lot needs to be done to, to, to overcome that uh, challenge. And it, as you all know, it's a major economic burden to individual and the society, economically and financially. So there is, and as, as, as a gentleman pointed out, why we haven't done anything in the past 30 years. One, one apart, of, apart from many other reasons, there are one particular reason. One is, we've been, no, we've been so far, we've been access to the you know, disease material. So for example, so if you want to study any disease, we wanted a live human material. Uh, for instance, in cancers, it's much easier, or, or, or any other uh, blood disorders, you can take the real-life blood and test them. But that can't be done in brain disorders, especially with neurodegenerative conditions. So you can't you know, put a needle and take some biopsies and test them in the lab. So we were lacking material to do uh, any live human-based research. And secondly, what that led to is we started doing quite a lot of animal modeling using uh, rodents and drosophilus, which is brilliant, but there's a huge translation leap between 
humans and rodents uh, because there's a quite a lot of evolutionary divergence. So that lends uh, quite well why, why we don't, so that, that, that answers a part of the problem why we haven't found an effective treatment in the past 30, 40 years with the help uh, in, in neurodegenerative diseases. So what, what can we do with the stem cells? So as we all know, stem cells are, are, are building blocks of the brain, uh, uh, of the body. So then the main, so, this is a pointer. so these are embryonic stem cells over here. So and, and what it can do is the power of stem cells is it can develop into any cell type, any organ, and uh, so therefore the entire human, entire human body. One important thing is that the, 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 broadly there are two types of stem cells. One we call it as a pluripotent stem cells, which can form, as I said before, any different type of cells. And the other one is the adult stem cells. So these are specialized stem cells which are located in different parts of the body, but they can only pro, uh, proliferate or generate a niche type of cells. So be, for example, if you take a bone marrow stem cells, it can generate only subtypes of cells which are related to the blood. But the pluripotent stem cells, which are shown over here in the green, which is a colony of uh, uh, cells, so they're individual cells. They're, they're, they're probably about a million cells in that colony. And each cell can be converted into, and each single stem cell can be converted into many different types of cells. And it has a potential to self-renew as well. So it can proliferate on its own. So we can cryopreserve. So what it gives us an opportunity is uh, you can scale up quite a lot. But again, the embryonic stem cell, how do we get that? So it was isolated in 19, early 90s, uh, late 90s during, uh, uh, from, from human in vitro fertilization before pre-implantation. Pre so you can take a few of the cells, and those are the cells which are embryonic stem cells, which are pluripotent, which can, again, be uh, converted into many different types. However, again, there's a problem over there. If you are studying uh, a, a disease like a neurodegenerative diseases, which are coming at pretty uh, late on site, so we don't have access to those embryonic stem cells because th those are only during, during the in vitro fertilization and there's no way we can get that. So that's where the new technologies uh, uh, are very important. So the one important question is, can we turn back the clock? So meaning, can we turn the adult cell, which are like skin cells or the blood cells, back into stem cells? Therefore, we can have an un unlimited supply of uh, patient-derived cells and we can study, we can model them into a, a neurons or a different parts of the brain, and then mod, mod, do a disease modeling. So one of those pioneering work was done in Scotland, which is, which you all know is a, one of the highly uh, celebrated sheep in the world, which is the dolly. So that's the uh, first uh, example of cloning, uh, uh, mammalian cloning using adult, no, adult uh, somatic cells. So meaning that they've taken a differentiated cell which have already had a, a postcode and taken that and then made into a, uh, made a new organism out of it. Although this wasn't efficient, what it told us was there is a potential that if you, you can convert a differentiated post-mitotic cell back into stem cell and therefore you can convert them back into whatever cell type we want. So that was in 1998, the dolly the shape from Sir Ian Wilmoth. Fast pace, 10 years later, there was an amazing uh, Japanese scientist. What he did was he identified a trick whereby he, took, he can take any type of uh, 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 cells, like skin, like uh, what I'm sure uh, explained, and then added four different proteins together, and then he turned them into uh, stem cells. So, that, so this process roughly takes about, about four, four months in lab, but what it essentially does is, it, you can take, uh, so you can make stem cells from any patient at any time point. Now, nowadays, there are even opportunities to make stem cells from urine samples. So even if, you, if you're thinking about making stem cells from babies, you don't have, even have to do a, lab, a skin puncture. You can collect the urine, take cells from that, and again, reprogram them back to uh, uh, stem cells. So, so the advantage, again, here is it, it's now has given us a, bes we can make a bespoke patient-derived cells, and therefore we can study the human 
uh, study the human disease in a human uh, system. So once we make all the stem cells, why is it that, why is it very important? So this is a graph from uh, one of our uh, scientists, Ricardo Dolmesh and Novartis. What, what it predicts is, what it plots is uh, different animal, different models and how is this relevant to the human and how is it good for mechanistic understanding. As we all know, in our, in our sciences, mo most of the study starts with uh, human postmortem tissue. So what, once we know what, where the problem starts, then we uh, trace back and try to find the mechanism. So, so the human postmortem is probably the starting point and has a higher human relevance. However, to, that doesn't lend too much into it to understand why is that happened. So it's, it's always like the last point. Then we go into, when we, we start putting the same uh, risk genes and into lower animal models and mouse models, and then they are brilliant for mechanistic understanding. What we can do over there is we can follow up from the start of the journey till the end of the journey and see assess where things go wrong. They are brilliant. But the problem, again, is it, it, it is not high throughput. So it's laborious, it's time consuming. However, and again, there are quite a lot of challenges, as I said before, genetically and uh, uh, to translate anything from mouse and other organisms towards the humans. So that's where we think that iPSCs, or induced pluripotent stem cells, uh, can, lend its, uh, 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 can lend itself that it, it can be more mechanistic, it can be higher of human relevance because it is from the same patient carrying the same genetic disorder. Second, it's got, uh, uh, we, we can understand mechanistically because it is, you can make those cells grow in the lab, you, you can uh, mo uh, monitor them day in and day out and you can find what the problem is. And thirdly, because it is unlimited supply, because we can make them in the lab in a, in a dish, we can, make, we can scale it up in a large, uh, in, 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 a, in a high throughput way and then screen for quite a lot of compounds, drugs and stuff to reverse any mutation. So again, this is, this is sort of an overview of what, what generally uh, we do with the stem cells with respect to the neurodegenerative diseases. So basically we start, uh, we start from the patient, take, take a skin biopsy or a blood sample, collect the cells, add the four proteins which is labeled over here, and then make them into uh, patient-specific iPS cells. So from there on, there are, if, if there's a genetic uh, predisposition, what we generally, nowadays what we also do is we do the gene correction using a latest a technology called CRISPR-Cas9. So now what happens is now you have a patient-derived stem cells with a mutation, and then you have a gene-corrected uh, stem cells as well. Now you can compare apples and apples. In, rather, and ev rest everything is the same apart from the genetic mutation. And then you can take it into two routes. One in you can have a cell therapy, which is quite popular in Parkinson's diseases, where you can make those, uh, uh, do the gene correction and make the, uh, uh, the cell type which is uh, affected in the Parkinson's, which is the dopaminergic uh, neurons. You can make them in a dish and then transplant it back to the patient. So that's one approach. That, works, that probably works for Parkinson's disease because it's only one cell type which is affected. However, for motor neuron disease like, uh, and Alzheimer's disease, what, what is more pragmatic is what we can use these cell, stem cells to make motor neurons or any affected cell types like other supporting cells in brain and screen for and find, do a mechanistic understanding what, what is going wrong. And if you find a phenotype, if one of them is shorter and one of them is longer, which uh, Arpan will follow up with after my talk, you can do an, a high throughput drug screening to find some drugs which can reverse any of those deficiencies. And then you can get that drug back to patient. So, so I just wanted to end over here saying that this is one of the quotes from a Nobel laureate saying that progress in science depends on the new techniques, new discoveries, and then new ideas, and probably in that order. The reason why I'm reiterating is we started to get the tools ready for uh, investigating most of the complex disorders in the brain. And I'll, I'll hand on to Apan Mehta, who will discuss more about what we are doing in the lab with these things. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure and privilege to be here. Um, I'm doing a PhD with um, Professor 
Chandran, and uh, Bhuvanesh is my bench supervisor, so I le learn a lot from him. And uh, he set the scene very nicely about what I'm going to try and uh, wow you with, hopefully, which is what, what we're doing in the lab and some of the applications about what you've just heard about this amazing stem cell technology. So um, it all starts off with the patient and comes back to the patient. So you've, you've heard very nicely that we can take a simple skin biopsy um, and reprogram these cells into stem cells. And then those stem cells can be given a postcode and made into any type of cell that you want. Now, we're interested, of course, in the brain cells, of which there are four main types. Um, I'm very interested in the motor neuron. Um, and as uh, Professor Dame Pamela Shaw uh, showed you, you know, it can be me the, the, the cable, the wire can be as, as long as a meter. That cable is called the axon. And um, however, that cell in its isolation is, is, is not enough to understand. We're, we're understanding more and more in motor neuron disease that the other cells are as important. Um, and so the beauty about stem cell technology is that you don't, you, you don't have to just study one cell in isolation. You can study them together. And so we're also able to make the other cell types, which are called the glia, or glue, and they're supporting cells. So there's the oligodendrocyte, which is the key cell in multiple sclerosis. Uh, and what that provides is the insulation around those wires of the neuron. You've got the astrocyte, the star-shaped cell, which was also introduced earlier. And really, uh, really quite special, uh, because we're only just beginning to really understand the role of this cell in, in motor neuron disease is the microglia. So these, I, 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 I like to think of them as the brain police, and we'll see why in a moment. So by studying these cells in a dish from patients, we can uh, better understand what's going wrong, and that's disease modeling. And if we understand what's going wrong, we can then try and fix it. The other nice thing about stem cell technology is that you can do very large-scale drug discovery. And this can be... Uh, sort of two broad approaches. The first is you can use the information from what's going wrong to develop a new drug. That's quite hard. What's perhaps a bit easier, at least sort of conceptually, is to use drugs that are out there already and repurpose them uh, for motor neuron disease because there may well be drugs or even chemicals from nature which might actually... Uh, have an effect, at least in the cell in the dish. And then, of course, it needs to be translated further to real-life clinical trials. So stem cells can tackle both of these things. And so, as I've already said, I'm interested in the motor neuron in my PhD. I'm sort of midway through. And um, I'm particularly interested in that, those long wires, the axon. And essentially what we can do, using microscopes and other technologies, we can look at the various components, so not only the genes, but the proteins, the cellular machinery, and ask what's going wrong. So I'm going to give you a flavor, and, and, and this is uh, stem cell research is a team effort. The stem cells don't give you a single day off. So whilst I'm here, the t uh, my other colleagues are in the lab feeding the cells. Uh, they're very needy cells and, and very expensive to, to maintain. Um, so... Um, the first finding quite early on in, 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 in my PhD uh, is that, as so I'm, I'm studying the C9ORF72 mutation, which we've already heard is the commonest known genetic mutation in ALS. And what we, what we see here are some motor neurons. They're, they're, they're colored in green. And on the left, you can see motor neurons from healthy people. And you can see the, 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 the axon, the wire, is quite long. However, in the disease case on the right, it's, it's much, much shorter. And these are from iPS-derived uh, motor neurons. And so if you, I mean, it's, it's an interesting question why this is happening, and, and I'm actively looking at that. But if you could find a drug that converted the, uh, that, that sort of lengthened the axon, made it back towards the, the left-hand side panel, that would be potentially a very important drug. And that's sort of more uh, scientifically shown on, on, the, on the graphs below. So if we can make the pink bars um, up to the blue, we might be, uh, we might be in, in for something that might be very, very valuable. I'm also interested in the cellular batteries, which are the mitochondria. 
that are whizzing up and down, as, as Professor Dame Pamela Shaw said, whizzing up and down the axons. And in red here, you can see these mitochondria dancing up and down the axon. This is a, it's a live image, so the pictures are taken every few seconds, and you can see those microscopic uh, organelles, the mitochondria, moving up and down. And you can ask the question, well, are these going wrong in motor neuron disease? Now, if you focus on the, the, the pink panel at the top, which is labeled healthy, you can see that in healthy people, those mitochondria, as you can see, are whizzing up and down at a, quite a fast rate. A lot of them are moving. Unfortunately, in this model, in the disease case, which is the, the, the lower right panel, you can see that the mitochondria are hardly moving at all. And actually, some of you may be thinking they look a bit odd as well. They look swollen. They look more circular-like. So again, if we can find a drug makes the bottom panel more like the top, that might be of interest. This is another thing we've found, uh, and, and others have found ac across the world. So there's, a, there's a, 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 a structure inside the cell, which is sort of akin to the Royal Mail sorting center. And what this does is it packages things, quite busy at Christmas time, pa packages things, proteins, and sends them to the correct place. This is called the Golgi apparatus. And again, what we see, uh, when you do a 3D reconstruction, again, from these stem cell-derived motor neurons, on the left, you can see that this apparatus, the Golgi apparatus, looks like that. And you might think, well, that's fine, all very, very interesting. But if you look at the right, the disease case, I, I think I can convince you that the, the Golgi apparatus look very swollen and fragmented. And, you know, you can ask the question again, why is this happening? But you could also say, well, are there drugs which can convert the right to the left? Um, these are some really amazing videos from uh, colleagues in, in our lab. On the left um, is the oligodendrocyte, which I, which I showed you. We can make oligodendrocytes in a dish from patients. And this is, this is exactly that. So I said the, the oligodendrocyte creates the myelin, the insulation, the sheath around the neuron. So what you can see here, really amazingly, is the oligodendrocyte there in the center and the tubes, the sheaths, the myelin can remarkably be, be actually modeled in a dish. And then uh, this is my favorite video on the right, the cellular police. So here you'll see the microglia. So th th there is this idea of you know, the role of inflammation in motor neuron disease. And these cellular police, they, you'll see, they, they have these appendages. They go grab nastiness and gobble them up into the cell. And you'll see here, you'll see that we've put beads inside the dish, and when those beads are taken up by the cell, they fluoresce green. And you can actually count how hungry this cell is by counting the number of beads. And you could ask the question, um, are, be are, uh, you know, are, the beads, uh, are there fewer beads being taken up? So I'll just show you the video. So you can see the beads being engulfed by the microglia into the cell. So. I'm just going to end, I've got a minute left, with um, uh, the drug discovery part. And, and this is obviously very important to you. So it, it, it's a very long journey, um, far too long, uh, to, to find drugs for this devastating disease. And so we need to accelerate this. And, and stem cells can help us, I believe. Um, you know, there's a one in 10,000 odds here in the, in the, in the classical uh, pathway. And, you know, we need to do better. So if we can accelerate this process, uh, it's a great thing. And I wanted to bring the dish with me, but basically you can grow these stem cells, the, uh, these neurons, in a, big pl in a plate. So here there are 96 of these small wells, and each of those 96 wells you can grow hundreds of neurons. And then you can, ask, you can basically do a massive drug screen of drugs that are already out there and novel drugs, and ask the question, for instance, is there a drug that can make the axons bigger? And so I'm going to end with this slide, which is showing that this is really happening right now. Um, uh, so this is a video of a, one of these 96-well plates being taken out of an incubator where the cells are being looked after at 37 degrees, taken out automatically and put onto a microscope system Each of those wells can have a different drug, for instance, and the microscope takes the images and produces the data. And then you use clever 
artificial intelligence software which can make those sorts of comparisons. So I'm going to end there um, by saying thank you very much. None of this work would be possible without your support. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll be very happy to take questions and meet some of you afterwards. Thank you. Okay, thanks to both uh, presenters for a very clever presentation. I'm sure you'll uh, agree. So we've got the cutting edge of uh, one line of MND research brought right into this hall. That was uh, a fascinating presentation. So uh, thanks uh, to both of you. Um, I think uh, in light of the time pressures, probably move swiftly on to the, uh, the final presentation, which is uh, going to be uh, delivered by Professor Orla Hardiman. Um, she was uh, appointed the first full professor of neurology in Ireland um, by the Trinity College uh, University of Dublin in 2014 where uh, Orla heads up the academic uh, unit of neurology. She is a consultant neurologist at the National Neuroscience Centre of Ireland at the Beaumont Hospital in Dublin, and she leads a team of 30 researchers focusing on clinical and translational aspects of MND research. Thank you, Orla. Uh, thanks very much. Um, it's great to be here. Um, uh, today um, I'm, I'm Irish. I, I speak um, so to Fáilte River Fad, Tacht go on in Alban. That's Irish for welcome to um, Scotland. The awesome or I'm very happy to be here. Um, so I, I think this actually the the previous speakers actually set up my talk very well, and so, some of what I'm going to say is going to be repetitive, but I, I don't think that's a particular problem. I share uh, Pam's optimism. We're, we're almost of an age. She's much older than me, actually. But, um, <laughs> um, but um, we're, we're, we're um, and she's far more successful as well. But we, we do, um, we share optimism, I think, um, more so than, than any time in the past. And I agree with her. And I, I think there's not only like um, just before um, the antibiotics for TB or, or, or penicillin um, were identified, but also it feels like the the year before we got had treatments for MS, and MS is a much more difficult uh, disease to treat. But now we have 10 or 15 drugs for MS, and it feels like that. It feels like about 20 years ago when we were just beginning to understand MS. So I think we really are on the cusp of something really exciting, and it's great to uh, be able to talk about that, having been working in the field for over 20 years as well. And I think one of the things that came out uh, of all of the talks was one of the big challenges that we have. And I mean, I think the, the question that you asked, the challenge that you put to us is, why haven't we done better? And the answer is because the ALS or motor neuron disease is, is a human disease. It's not a disease that occurs normally in animals and we have to make it in animals. And then we made all sorts of presumptions about how we could um, translate the findings or the, the, the successes that we had in animals back to humans. So if, you have, if you're a mouse with motor neuron disease, and I don't know if there are any mice in the room here with motor neuron disease, it's, we, it's your day that we can cure motor neuron disease in mice, and Pam has shown that. But, we, but the challenge is now to, to bring those successes with the caveats uh, that are attached to them into humans, and that's really the challenge that we have now. Now, this is, this is um, uh, the same, more or less the same slide that... Um, Brian showed that ALS is a complicated disease. It's a, a combination of genes and environment in humans. So the mouse motor neuron disease has a gene, uh, a human gene, and that we can understand what that particular human gene is doing in that particular mouse with that particular genetic background. But it's much more complicated and messy when we try and bring this into humans because we're much more complicated organisms. We're much messier and we have lots of different genetic backgrounds. And that's one of the reasons why it's been difficult to bring the findings from the mice into the humans. As Brian said, that we, we, we have a combination of gene and environment. And the, if you have a genetic risk, there are a number of other environmental things that might happen that might make, make you develop motor neuron disease. We've been very good at finding the genes, and Brian mentioned Project Mine, and that's been very, very successful, we'll, is a gift that we'll keep on giving over the next uh, 10 or 15 years to understand the genetic basis, not just of the 
familial motor neuron disease, of which there are maybe 10 or 15% of people, actually probably more like 20 or 30% if you look at all of the genes, um, but, but also the, the non-familial the types of motor neuron disease that don't run in families, but where there's a genetic uh, component to that. That's going to be complicated. We're not there yet. There's a lot of work to do. It's very challenging from a mathematical and statistical point of view, as, as Brian pointed out. There are billions and billions of, of variations, but we're getting there. That is happening. Um, so what we have learned, and I think what has come out of the previous speakers, that is that ALS, or motor neuron disease, is a syndrome. It's a, it's a disorder that we can recognize as clinicians, like pneumonia is a syndrome, or cancer is a syndrome. So it's a condition that we recognize that as doctors, we can diagnose and we can treat with symptoms, that the symptomatic treatment, the things that we can do to try and make life a bit easier. Um, but like pneumonia or like cancer, actually sorting out what's going on underneath is much more difficult and we need the tools to do that. So I kind of agree with the, with the, with the statement that we, if we have the techniques, we can come up with the, with the clever ideas and we can come up with the, with, with the mechanisms. So I, I, think, I think that we are beginning to get there and that's what my talk is going to be about. So if we, if we, can, if we know that we can subdivide divide, divide motor neuron disease, the syndrome into the subtypes, I think that's one way forward. And I think, as Brian said, when he started um, as uh, uh, the scientific director in MNDA, it was around the same time I started in motor neuron disease, although he looks much older than me as well. But anyway, um, um, I, I think we did think it was one disease. I worked at Bob Brown's lab when, when SOD1 was identified, and I was 12 then. Um, <laughs> uh, but um, so, so we thought, oh, SOD1, we've, we fixed the problem, we understand the mechanisms, and then we'll get the cure in the next five or ten years. And how wrong we were, it's much more complicated than that. So the mistake that we made was that we were very uh, presumptuous and a bit arrogant about how we thought we could progress things. And it was a very expensive form of arrogance because it, it amounted to about 40 trials that we did over the last 20 years or so, all of which were negative. So that's very demoralising. And some of the reasons for that are, as I said, that the animal-based approach um, ha has been very helpful in one way, allowing us to understand the, the biochemistry and the, the biology of what's going on, but, but we, we haven't really paid enough attention to the risks of bringing the work from the animal into the human. So the likelihood in the future, and as Pam showed very elegantly um, in the laboratory, is that we'll have to be able to divide people into subgroups in the same way as we don't treat all pneumonias with penicillin because some people might have TB, or we don't treat all cancers with a single anti-cancer drug because there are lots of different types of cancer. And it's the same, it's the same method. It's the same, uh, it's the same concept. So we, but one of the difficulties that we have, which, which is also mentioned, is we're not very good yet at understand, at, at, we don't actually have the tools yet um, that can take out um, or the different, that can help us to subdivide the different types of motor neurons. So we can't take a piece of the brain out and look at it and then put it back in. We can do it a little bit with stem cells, but there's a lot of complexity that we can't do there. It's kind of like um, um, looking at a play and trying to understand what's going to play by looking at the shadows of the actors on the wall. Uh, because we can't actually look at the play itself. We can't actually look at the full face of the actors. So we have to work really hard at a human level to, to build better ways of, of understanding how the brain works. And, and we also have to be better and clever about how we design our trials. And actually, a lot of this meeting is going to be about those last two points. We'll get a lot of the basic science as well at this meeting. It's very important. But what we really need to do, and I need to do as a clinician and, and the other clinical people at this meeting, are to really deliver on the last two points there. So most of my talk is going to be on that. And I think that we won't be treating just the motor neuron the motor neuron disease. I think we'll be treating lots of different parts of motor neuron disease because lots of different parts of the nervous system give trouble in motor neuron disease. So we can, and we can divide it into this very complicated, but phenotype, you know, is it upper or low motor neuron? Is it PLS or is it ALS? Looking at, we can divide by genetics. We can divide by whether thinking is affected. We can divide by whether behavior is affected. We can use some of the newer tools that we have to see whether they're changing, like the, the changes in the brain using imaging or using um, brainwave testing. And so then we can develop new outcome measures as well. We can divide people based on some of the characteristics that they might have. And then we can use better outcome measures because some of the outcome measures that we're using are very antiquated. I'll talk a little bit about that. So what's the implication this for this in the future trials? Well, the thing is that 
it is really exciting because all of the technologies that you've heard about before my talk have allowed us to develop or to, under, or to, to seek to test many, many new drugs. There's a lot more drugs on the horizon than there were even five or ten years ago. So, so maybe probably about ten years ago there was this concern that there was a, a, a crisis in innovation in the neuroscience and companies weren't going to be interested in, in developing new drugs in neuroscience. That's just plain wrong now. There are 15 or 20 new drugs under development uh, by, by industry and there are many, many, many other drugs that would be suitable for repurposing in, in the stem cell laboratories. So there's a lot of opportunity here and we shouldn't mess it up. So we don't want to mess it up anymore. So the, at the moment, there, there are 24 phase two trials and four phase three trials listed on clinicalgov.com, which is the, the, um, the, the site that, that um, collects all the information about clinical trials. It's a U US site around the world. So lots and lots of trials underway. Um, but all of the trials really should be focusing on this concept of precision medicine that Pam mentioned. This is the Wikipedia definition of precision medicine, uh, which is that it's tailored to medical treatment, the right drug for the right patient at the right time. So we've set up a consortium in Europe actually called TRICALS. It was set up by Leonard Vandenberg in Holland and myself. It's called Treatment Research Initiative QLS. It's a very clunky term because it's Dutch. They're, they're, they're very good scientists, but their command of English needs much to be desired. So, so it's called TRICALS. He's not here. It's not. Um, and, and that's some of the members of TRICALS here. We had some, we've had um, we have a European consortium called NCALS. We met in, and that's in Trinity, Trinity College a couple of years ago when we met. Um, so the mission of TRICALS is exactly that. It's to get the right drug for the right patient in the right time and the right dose. And we don't have a lot of time to this because we want to be able to treat people. So that's what we want to do. So we put together a, a, a roadmap for the future to develop new, to, to get better drugs at, at the right time and the right patient um, in the right dose. So there, there are a number of different lanes or pathways that we've, we've decided we're going to invest in over the next five years. And so I'm going to go through some of these really quickly. So we want to select people better. This is what Pam was saying with motor neuron disease or ALS is heterogeneous. It's like pneumonia in the past or like cancer in the past. So we need to get better ways of, of understanding the different subtypes of motor neuron disease. So we have some ways of doing that. We know that there's a lot of variation in, in, in how fast the disease, progress, the disease progresses. And we know that some of the re these reasons that Brian said age of onset um, the, the burden of disease and whether the brain is affected in other areas as well, whether it starts in speech and swallowing or the arms and the legs, and how fast it progresses. So we know a little bit about those things and genetic background. And we know that if we, if we do mathematical analyses using the registers that we have, so we have one in Ireland and there's, uh, there's one in England, there's one in Scotland, there, there are a number around, around Europe as well, we can, we can divide people into, into subgroups and we can understand a little bit about, about some of the factors that lead to the subgroups, but, but not everything. We don't know all of the factors that m make these people belong to one of those groups. We know some of them, but not all of them. So we need to understand why that is. A lot of more work to do in that. We know genetics are... are a factor. We know there are 30 genes of major effect, but there's lots of other genes that are, have some effect, um, and we, there are almost certainly protective genes as well, and we know that from population studies, and we've done some of this work in, in the Caribbean as well, showing that uh, if you're a mixed population, you're protected from developing motor neuron disease. So why is that? What, what are the factors that are both making some people more prone and some people less prone? A lot of work to, to happen there. We're not really there yet. I think it'll take some time for us to be able to segregate people who don't have a single gene genetically, but I think it will happen. Um, we, we can already select people using an algorithm or a, a, a work plan that was developed by, by uh, Leonard Van Vandenberg's group in Holland. So you can put in a number of parameters about the condition and it'll give a probability of survival. Actually, it's not surprising that Stephen Hawking actually lived as long as he did. Using our prediction model, we would have predicted that Stephen Hawking lived as long as he did, and then he got ventilated, and then he lived a lot longer. So, so our prediction model would have predicted Stephen Hawking's outcome as well. We also need better biobanking, so we need samples from people, like people, pieces of skin, so we can develop uh, stem cells. We need to understand if there's inflammation going on. Some types of motor neuron disease seem to have evidence of inflammation in their blood, so we need to be able to collect uh, blood samples from people. We need to be able to develop these iPS cells that, that, that um, 
that, that our speakers have been talking about. And also we need um, uh, to be able to collect brain and spine for people who sadly pass away uh, so that we can do further studies such as Pam showed in, in her presentation. Uh, we also need to recognise that motor neuron disease, even though it's called motor neuron disease, isn't just a disorder of motor neurons. And we know now that a very high proportion of people will have a little bit of thinking problem and a little bit of behavioural problem. And we can divide motor neuron disease now into people who are more likely or less likely to have thinking problem and also more likely or less likely to have changes in their behaviour and also the types of changes in behaviour that people might get. So not everybody gets it, but some people do. And that's also a way that we can segregate people. We need to understand why that happens, what are the factors that drive that, that make some people be, be fine and not have any thinking problem at all and some people to develop a dementia. So we need to understand that as well. And there are clearly factors that are doing that. So that is subtyping. We also need to... Uh, develop biomarkers, ways of, of identifying what's going on in the brain. And, and um, sorry, I don't think. Uh, yes, yeah, so, so biomarkers of disease to, to, to measure disease progression. At the moment, we have a, something called the ALS FRS, and you can actually do that on your iPhone. You can measure uh, the, the, the types of disability that you have using this functional rating scale. Um, and it's a 48-point scale, and we use these in trials all the time. But actually, when we dissect out that scale, which we've done a couple of years ago, it's not a very good scale because it's not a straight line. So that's not a particularly good outcome measure if you divide it out into subgroups. So we need to understand why that is and get better scales that we can measure outcome more, more accurately. So what kind of biomarkers might we want to look at? Well, we need markers of thinking, behaviour, and and also markers of the overall way that the disease is progressing. So better imaging. We have a good uh, MRI scanning now, and there's, a, there's actually today and tomorrow, there's a meeting of the people who are interested in brain imaging going on in Edinburgh. Um, so there's a group of people worldwide who are building programs so that we can get better ways of, of imaging the brain so that we can identify the changes that happen in the brain and we can measure that in clinical trials. So that's happening already. So we can now reliably distinguish the different parts of the brain that are affected. So it's not quite as good as taking a piece of the, um, the, the brain out and looking at it, but it's, it's, it's getting there. It's better um, than it was. It's, it's better than just getting an x-ray of the chest for pneumonia. Now we should be able to define what parts of the brain are becoming more affected. So this is one uh, set of images that we generated just showing the differences in people who have the C9 off variant versus people who don't. But this is, that's a couple of years old now. There are many more um, uh, brain imaging studies that will allow us to understand even to a greater extent what's happening. We can also look at brainwave activity. Brainwave activity is very cheap to measure because it's just doing, putting an EEG cap or an electroencephalograph um, cap on, on the person and then collecting the brainwaves that are happening and using mathematical tools um, that um, complex um, uh, engineering-based uh, processes, we can start measuring what's actually going on in the brain in real time. And that can tell us what's going on in terms of the parts of the brain might be, that might be affected to a greater or lesser extent in motor neuron disease. So that, that can be very helpful as well. And we can also identify the, um, the sources from where, where these, these changes in the brain are happening using mathematical modelling as well. So that can give us a, a lot of information. Again, more tools that we can use to understand uh, both where disease is happening and how it's progressing. And those tools then we can use to segregate people out into different subgroups and also to measure the effects of, of um, drugs on the brain, which we haven't been able to do up to now. Um, we also need better laboratory biomarkers. Uh, so we have lots of studies going on looking at um, things that change in the blood and the spinal fluid that might give us both a clue to how the, the subtypes of disease, but also clues to whether the drug is working or not. Um, so we're working on that as well. What else do we need to do? We want to actually be really uh, have a standing army uh, of um, uh, people interested in clinical trials and also a standing group of people who want to engage in clinical trials. So we want to develop a pan-European um, platform to collect data and coordinate clinical studies. Um, and we'll even let people who are not in Europe into that as well. If you're very good, we'll let you in, um, even if Brexit happens. Um, so at the moment, where, where the, the groups that are involved in trying to put this pan-European uh, electronic patient record are listed here, and as you can see, there are a couple of sites in, in the UK as well. Uh, so we're working very hard to develop that as well. And the plan is, as I said, precision medicine. So this is a, 
then we'll have a number of new designer treatments come, um, already in process based on genetics. This, these are talked about um, before, and, but based on um, whether the, there's a drug that works with a particular genetic subtype, and there are some examples of that as well. I'm just going to, in the last two minutes, describe three studies uh, really quickly that are already um, just about to start that will be not pharma, led but but investigator led these are repurposed drugs drugs that we think may work but that are outside a patent or the, that industry isn't interested in doing so we will do these ourselves so one of them is a light it's called lighthouse 2 and it's actually a drug that's used in aids because we think that there may be um, in some people a, a, a virus that would otherwise be, be harmless becomes reactivated and that that might be helping driving motor neurons in some people there's another drug called another a study called Adore, which we're designing, which is the tablet form of Redarava and the tablet form of Radicot or Radicava. And so that's going to hopefully in the next year or so. And then the third is a, is a study called Prelude, which is a study of a drug called lithium, which was used a couple of years ago. Uh, didn't see any benefit, and actually people on lithium seem to have done worse. But in fact, it, it, uh, if you take out a subgroup of people of a particular genetic marker, the lithium looks like it might work. So, there's, so I'm not going to go through these in any great detail because um, I'm being told that my time is up. Um, but um, these are the anti-sense oligonucleotides. Um, so these, these are really exciting. So eventually, motor neuron disease or ALS will be segregated based on these different characteristics, like I said earlier, with different outcome measures depending on the characteristics. So the future is going to look like this. We'll have lots of different characteristics. We'll be targeting different drugs. We'll target different aspects of the disease. We'll have, we'll, we'll have patients grouped into these different um, subgroups, with what I call pragmatic clusters, and then we'll have clinical trials that are testing outcomes from each of these. We'll define what the outcomes want to be, and then o o over time we'll get a combination of new treatments. So as Pam said, it won't be just one drug. It'll be a combination of drugs, drugs with multiple actions, and multiple drugs with single actions. And I think the future is very bright, the new treatments in LS will be driven by a precision medicine approach. And I think that the better patient selection and trial design and proven, improved outcomes that, we're, uh, that we've committed ourselves to for the next five years um, in trials, I think that's where, where, it's, where we're going to make a big difference. And I hope we'll be able to, in a couple of years' time, come back to say we've done it. You know, we'll, have, we'll have the drugs. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Orla, for a very wide-ranging and fast-paced uh, presentation. I'm sorry to press you a little bit uh, at the end uh, here. Um, and uh, also thanks for citing another brilliant example of European partnership. Not that we're taking sides in this Brexit debate, but uh, <laughs> just put that down as a, a marker and leave it there. Um, uh, we have a, a debate on uh, aspects of uh, MND uh, to follow uh, over the next... Uh, I think we should take 20 minutes, unless I'm going to get a hook from the back. We'll finish, uh, aim to finish up at 4.40. If you absolutely need to um, uh, exit at 4.30, we'll understand. Um, but uh, I think given the, the scope of the, the presentations, the, the level of interest here, and uh, perhaps uh, uh, tuned in from elsewhere, we should allow uh, 20 minutes or so for questions. So um, I would like uh, to invite questions, comments um, from the floor. Um, we've got roving microphones, and I, I'd like to take uh, uh, this gentleman here first of all, and then this gentleman in the second row, and we'll try and keep the pot boiling. I'll come back to you, uh, sir, uh, later on. So thank you. And uh, if you have a, a question for a specific member of the panel, please identify. Otherwise, um, we can... Uh, go uh, at uh, random, so to speak. Okay, thank you. Hi, Professor Hartman. Howdy, man. Yeah, I'm interested to hear you say that, that you had a specific test to see how long we would live for. And you said that you could predict, uh, yeah. pr pr Professor. Is that being used at diagnosis? Uh, um, and, and at which stage during the disease can uh, it be employed? So I think a, um, an experienced uh, clinician who, who sees people with motor neuron disease uh, we'll have a, a, a reasonable sense when we see people once or twice um, to, to we'll, we'll have a reasonable sense about whether this is you know, going to move very fast or move fairly slowly. Um, so what we did was we took, we took six or eight different uh, things that we could measure uh, in the first or second visit and just did a, a, a sort of a mathematical model um, 
that, that provided with, within it, you know, there's an, a margin of error um, as to how long somebody is likely, whether it's going to be very fast or very slow. Um, I'm not sure that it's particularly helpful in a clinical setting to do that, but it's very helpful if we're recruiting people into clinical trials uh, because we can then make sure that we have the same proportion of people in, the, in, in each arm of the trial, whether somebody is in a, on the treatment arm or the, the non-treatment, the placebo arm. Uh, because if, if sometimes we can make a mistake in trials and people, um, the, the arms aren't fully balanced as we might get either uh, an indication that a drug is working that when it isn't working, Sorry, the I, opposite. I didn't think it was a drug. I thought it was, I thought. No, I no, I'm saying if we're putting people into the clinical trial. So, okay, so, so yes, it, it is possible to do this um, so outside there, of a trial setting, yeah. So there is a test, you're saying it's not a, a test. questionnaire. No, it's not a test. It's a questionnaire a, it's, that you it's, fill it's out. A, no, it's not, it's not a test and it's not a questionnaire. It's, it's, it's kind of an algorithm. So it's, it's six or eight things, you know, um, the age of onset, the length of time, but from the first symptom to diagnosis, um, the okay. the rate of progression up to now, the breathing, um, okay, the, yes. the, the six or eight parameters that we can plug into this model. It's kind of a mathematical model, and it'll say you know a fifty percent or seventy five percent probability. So and how long has that been available for? It's it's uh, it got published last year in okay. in Lancet Neurology. Okay. Yeah. The reason I'm asking is that when I speak to other people, they uh, ALS that telling me that most of us are told we've got 18 months or two years. Yeah, that's just okay. plain wrong. Uh, yeah. Well, it would appear to be, especially yeah. in my situation. Yes. So yeah. um, can the yeah. test be taken, can the algorithm be used at any time? Yes, it can, yeah. Okay, yeah. where do I sign yeah. up? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it, uh, the reference is there. It's, it's, it's uh, in Lancet Neurology, ha Hank Jan Vestingen is the oh, first I'm, author. I'm remember I'll that. give it to you later. <laughs> I'll give it to you later. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you for your question. There's a gentleman here, and uh, was there uh, another uh, hand uh, raised in the in the hall? Um, yes, the, this, uh, this this lady here. So we'll take this gentleman, and then uh, we'll, I'll come back to you just uh, uh, in a moment. Um, if, uh, the gentleman on second row here, that. you got the microphone uh, working? Yep. Can you help the gentleman there? You ready? Hurry, hurry. Um, if not, we'll go to the uh, the, the lady. Oh, I see. I beg your pardon. Perhaps it, we'll, we'll, co we'll come back to that gentleman. A clinical study using interleukin-2 in conjunction with Rilazol being conducted in France and at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Glasgow. Okay. Who would like to take that uh, from the panel, Pam? I can, I can speak to that. S sorry, the, what was the question around the Miracle study? So, that, so there is a study of low-dose interleukin-2 happening at various um, sites in France and the UK, and Glasgow has just recently opened up as a site, which, which is great. But, but what was your question about it? Sorry, I may have missed it. Maybe if we have time at the end. It wasn't mentioned. It wasn't mentioned. It wasn't mentioned. That's right. oh. um, maybe if we have time at the end, I'll nip yeah. back to the, the back of the room because I have some slides about miracles that I'll be happy to, to show if you can spare me three minutes. Yeah. Thank you for raising that. Uh, um, it's uh, a, a really important uh, development, I think. Uh, that uh, Brian had uh, highlighted earlier. So the, I think the, the, it, is, it is really important because um, for the first time we're nesting into the trial the biomarkers and so on that all has been talking about. Um, so it's, it's a big commitment for, from patients to take part in that trial because we're measuring what happens in blood and, and cerebrospinal fluid um, and we're measuring what happens on Rilizol first for three months before the experimental drug. So, so really important. I think it's, it's simply the time um, available. We, 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 didn't, we couldn't go into every individual trial, but it is a really important study. Yes. So thank you for raising that. 
the, the lady here. Um, hi. Mine's not very technical, but I've been on Brazil for about um, a year and a half. Not much has happened. But um, I did notice in your um, uh, conference there the interesting factor of um, inflammation. And that breeds, brings me to inflammation where people fall or inflammation on viruses. This um, stands out in my mind as not being technical, but quite a big factor. Um, and I'm interested to see how you can um, deal with inflammation. Also shock to deal with people. Has this any effect on how the disease progresses? Thank you. Who would like to, to lead off on that uh, question? Pam, thank, uh, thank you. Can, I can start and maybe Ola would yes. add something. So um, I think in, it, 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 it is recognized that um, inflammation, inflammatory cells um, is, is really important in terms of the progression of MND. It, it probably doesn't start it off in the first place, but as the motor neurons begin to get damaged, those um, microglia uh, that we heard about from, from the, the stem cell presenters um, start, w whereas initially they may be protective towards motor neurons, as um, the disease gets going, they can end up being damaging um, to motor neurons. So the, the Myrocal's trial of low-dose interleukin-2 is all about trying to suppress inflammation. And it's been found, interestingly, um, there was a study from Texas in, in the United States that showed that people with motor neuron disease who happened to have a high blood cell count of these particular lymphocytes called Treg cells, so people with high Treg cells um, do better in terms of how the disease progresses over time. And when you, when you increase the Treg cells, it seems to make the microglia, the policeman in the nervous system, behave in a more protective rather than a damaging way. And that's what exactly what interleukin-2 in the Myrocal's trial is doing. We're trying to boost the, the, the Treg lymphocytes and therefore dampen down the damaging inflammation in the nervous system. Thank but you. Whether, but whether an inflammatory illness yes. um, actually starts MND off in the first place, I, I think is uh, there's no firm scientific evidence, but I've heard lots of patients say it was when I got that chicken pox as an adult that the whole thing started. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I think and, uh, and Orla, some, Orla, Orla would yeah. like to add, and, and then we'll, we'll come back to you just, just in a moment. Orla, thank yeah, you. Just to add a little bit on the inflammation, I think that's going to probably be another segregating factor because not everybody has the changes in the inflammation or they've, if there are different types of changes in inflammation we see. So I think that will be one of these factors that we will use in precision medicine. In terms of your question about shock um, and emotional shock or, or injury, um, there, there isn't really any strong evidence. Uh, some people think that, that uh, um, a, a, an injury uh, may, be, have, be, may be likely to set off motor neurons, but the evidence for that, in my opinion, isn't very strong. And I, I don't think it's, it's really good at the moment. I don't, I don't think there's any good evidence to su support that at the moment. Okay, thank you. I think the, the lady would like to come back. Uh, would you? Do you have another comment to make, uh, just to the microphone for a moment? Yeah, just a quick one. Speaking to people, um, we all talk about how things started um, and how the disease is progressing, I felt it would be a good idea to have a website where people with motor neuron could put their symptoms of how they started, when they started, how they feel. That might be of some use to clinicians in the future. Um, we are throughout the British Isles, and it might, it might just uh, throw something up that might be useful. 
So there, there is a site um, where you can do that. It's called Patients Like Me, and you can you can enter into that. And they they run they actually run studies as well. Patients Like Me have run some trials as well uh, using web based technology, and you can actually measure your own LS FRS and put that up. And there's also a chat room on the Patients Like Me as well. And that might be very useful. Thank yeah. you. So. Uh, Good question and, and a good suggestion. Thank you. Is the lady uh, to my left in the middle of the, the row there? Yes, thank you. Yeah, um, our experience of trying to get on a drug trial, um, we've, we've kind of discovered that the criteria are so tight that it excludes so many people and that's very frustrating. And I'm wondering why, um, can, can we not lobby pharmaceutical companies to widen it if they're setting the criteria? Or can we not um, can we not fast track patients uh, onto phase three clinical yeah. um, trials faster? Can we not do something about this? Yeah. Orla, thank you. Yeah. So I completely agree with you. Part of the problem that we have, and part of the challenge that we've set ourselves in trials, is because um, the outcome measures that we use at the moment are, are very specific, like the LSFRS and breathing. And they're the measures that, that are required for regulatory approval at the moment. So they're, they're really, it's, it's unfortunately, it's survival and then how fast you're progressing on the LSFRS. So what we need to do is, is open up, you know, a little bit, think, think a little bit more outside of the box on this and think about, like I was just saying about the attributes, that there are many other things that we could measure as long as we have a robot, a, a, a proper and valid um, way of measuring that that, that that doesn't have any variability in it. So I think we're, we're, everybody accepts and agrees that, um, that we're far too stringent in how we enrol people in clinical trials. If you look at all the trials that we've done so far, um, and we've tested this in our register, only about 6% of people with motor neurons disease are ever eligible for a clinical trial. So that's not really acceptable. So one of the purposes of trials is to have a trial for everybody, like in cancer, but, but we have to be better at saying what, what we want to measure. And that's what I was saying about the biomarkers. We need to have a better suite of biomarkers, better ways of measuring how the drug is responding. Um, so th that isn't just about looking at your LSFRS or looking at your vital capacity, because people who have bulbar onset disease aren't, a lot of people can't do trials at all because they can't do the breathing uh, into into the machine that gets your vital capacity. So we need to move beyond the existing measures that we have into better um, uh, outcome measures that, that are more relevant to people, but also that are acceptable uh, so that we can generate really good evidence that the drug is working, because we have to provide that for the regulatory uh, and reimbursement people. Uh, but, but I think that's a challenge we've set ourselves in, in, tri in TRICALS to really invest heavily and invest all of our, our um, collective wisdom and, and expertise and funding into um, how, to, how to make this better and make it more open for people at all stages of their disease that we can measure something in any, any aspect of this. I'll put up the idea about attributes that we want to be able to have outcome measures that, we can, that are, apply to every single part of the disease. Yeah, thank I you. Think, um, I think sorry, Br Brian would perhaps like yeah, to add to I that, and then I'll, to, I'll come add, back to you. Yeah, add a little bit to that because I'm, I'm always banging on about the need for biomarkers. You know, we just don't know what's going on in the inside. That's one of the challenges. And if I can use multiple sclerosis as an example, we've seen huge advances in the treatment of multiple sclerosis. A lot of drug companies. Um, coming in, developing effective treatments, and part of that was down to what I would call a biomarker, was the fact you could use an MRI scan mm -hmm. to actually see the lesions in the brain. And because you could see them, you could see what was going on in the inside, you could effectively do almost like a quick and dirty trial, and if the lesions got smaller, even if it wasn't clear if the drug was working on the outside, you could see it was having some effect on the inside, and that just gives the companies the, the confidence to then spend the tens of millions that are going to be required to take a drug through the trial process. So, um, you know, it's one of the reasons that with the Ice Bucket Challenge money, um, the biggest single project that the, the MND Association has invested in is actually developing a large biomarker collection from 
well, hopefully up to 900 people with MND who will be participating and donating samples at regular points through the course of their disease so that we can try and identify a blood test, a CSF test, maybe an MRI scan in combination that will help us to predict how a um, person's likely pr to progress. But then if we can recruit people who are likely to progress in the same way in trials, that means smaller trials. Smaller trials mean cheaper trials. Cheaper trials mean more trials. But I, I think it's more than that, Brian, as well. Mm -hmm. I, I think we need to be able to measure other aspects of what, what's going on as well. So, so that, um, because we are, the constraint, really, the 6% is constrained by um, uh, the likelihood of having an LSFRS, and that's what we use, um, the, the likelihood of that moving in a particular, at a particular rate. So if we, if we uh, have other ways, not just the LSFRS, but other ways of measuring disease progression that are data-driven, like imaging or this brainwave, testing that we can do. The, the, they're the, 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 the corollary of the MRI scan with gadolinium for MS. Uh, although that's not completely fixed yet either because the secondary progressive phase of MS has the same problem that motor neuron disease does. The MRI doesn't really work there in the way we use it. So the MS people are in the same boat as we are in terms of how do we, how do we measure progression? Um, how do we get people with later stage disease into trials where we can measure something that we that to, to determine whether the drug is actually working or not, because our measure is just not sensitive enough at the moment, and that's the problem. Okay. But I, I think just to reassure you, the the, the clinical um, the clinicians who see people with ALS are at one with you on this. We completely agree with you, and we are as frustrated as you, and we want to fix this. And and I just to give you an assurance that you know. Those of us who, who, who are engaged in trials and those of us who see people with ALS who are also engage in science want this fixed as well. And that's what we're going to work on. That's the big challenge for the next five years for us. Okay, I thank you. I hope you uh, that much. provides some reassurance yeah. for you. Do, do you wish you. to comment uh, further? Would you like to use the microphone uh, there, please? Thank you. Yeah, my, my wife tried to get on the microcals uh, uh, trial. And what the problem was that she was already, when she was diagnosed, you're automatically given Rizil. And the, uh, that excludes you from the microcals trial. Mm. So uh, it took us a little while to realize that, by which time, okay, now she's excluded. So had the person who diagnosed us said, would you like to go on any trials? Therefore, don't take the Rizil now until such times as you've been rejected from the trial. That would have helped. Okay. Yeah. Also, there's a question for, if I may sneak one in. Yes, just um, a quick question. Right, Thank quick you. One. Is this one yeah. for, for, for Dame Pam? Uh, we've just been offered a blood test for the C9 of uh, 72 gene to see if there's, uh, there's an. Now, are there any other tests that can be done? Because when, when she was being tested for that, I said, well, can she also be tested for the SOD1 at the same time? Can she also be tested for any other mutant genes? There's about 30 of them. Why can't you do yes. it all in parallel rather than sequentially? And the categorical answer I got was no, we do one at a time. Now, bearing in mind that this disease, you might not be around for the second or third test. Is that a sensible way to go about it? Or is there a, a real reason why we, you don't do it? So, Thank you. so um, th there are um, a small number of centers, and Sheffield is one, that will screen the whole panel of 30 genes. We tend to start with C9 because, um, because the change is in a linker sequence and not in the coding sequence of that gene. You test for that in a different way. So we test for C9, and then we do the panel of 30 genes. The, there's a cost to that, and um, gosh, it costs about... It is, let me, let me work out, because the number of genes has recently gone up. It costs about a thousand pounds to, to run the 30 genes. Um, 30 genes? Yeah. That's good value for money, isn't it? Yeah. Can, can I, but, but, but I think not all, not all NHS departments so we, accept we those costs. Can, can, I, can yeah. I just comment as well, because um, there, there's been a lot of discussion around genetic testing and, and what genes should we test for and, and who should be tested for what. And, and there's a very nice piece of work that, um, that was done a couple of years ago by the Italians looking at the frequency of, of the gene variants. And the reality of the situation is that in, in European populations, uh, the, the, the big genes are C9-ORF, uh, SOD1, 
um, TDP43 and FUS. And actually, the other genes are of theoretical academic interest. Uh, but but in, in terms of, of what we're going to do, they're, they're, they're actually very, very rare. You know? So they're very useful to model the disease to allow us to understand what might be happening in terms of the, bio the very complicated biology of the human. But, um, but in reality, from a clinical practice point of view, um, th those four are, are the big ones. And in fact, in Ireland, where I come from, we don't have any SOD1 at all. So we don't test for that because it doesn't, it's just not there in Ireland. We, it, that, our, our population d doesn't have it. So each, each population is a little bit different as well. So for example, C9 off isn't an important gene in Japan. Whereas where there's another gene called op optineurin, so so the genetic testing also is determined by, you know, how the likelihood of finding something, and secondly the likelihood that we might able to be do it, to be able to do something with that from a clinical point of view. But okay, but I think you. there might there may be um, further development. So as part of the Ambrosia study yeah. that Brian mentioned, where we're um, systematically collecting samples from volunteer patients. So we, as part of that, everyone who goes into it that gets the 30 panels panel of, of genes screened, and things are coming out um, quite frequently mm. on that in, in patients with no family history of MND, but we're finding one of those genes, or sometimes more than one of those genes, is is altered in in people who appear to have sporadic MND. So I think there there are going to be further developments. Okay, as thank you. As I'm going to, I'm gonna, I think, okay, with respect, I, I'm going to have to, to move on. Please, please could you... Yes. Yes. Yeah. No. Well, thank, thanks for your point, and I hope that uh, you can pick up uh, in specific terms if there's any uh, um, value in that uh, on an, an individual basis. So th thank you for your question. Um, we uh, have questions coming in from further afield. Uh, I think we have time. I'm looking to Craig here. I think we have time for one more. Um, and I would like to give that privilege to the audience uh, out with these four walls. And I think Neve has um, the question. Thank um, you, Neve. Yes, thanks. I actually have four questions, but I'll oh, just go with the first one that yeah, came please. in. <laughs> okay. um, and this is a question to all the panelists. Uh, Lee says, Firstly, thank you for choosing to work in the most challenging field of human disease research. How do each of you see the path to delivery of an effective therapy mapping out over the next five years? Just, a, yeah, just a, nice, a, nice, a nice little question to finish with. Um, I think, uh, can we give each of the panelists uh, a chance to take a stab at this? And I'm, uh, I'm going to give you 60 seconds All each, right. okay? All Maximum. Right. Go. So, so, so what we found out in, in, in all this meeting is we know that this brain disease is pretty complex. Five years seems to be a short time, but what, what, what we can promise or what we are trying to achieve is with all these tools and developments, we are trying to accelerate whatever we, we try to do. I mean, there's always an accelerate button than the day before. That, that's, that's one thing for sure what we're doing. I don't know whether within the five years we'll find something, but again, with the clinical trials or everything, what is evolving, even the clinical trials are evolving, so, and the, the, the repurposing of drugs can probably get, get somewhere. Okay, Pam, thank you. So I'm, I'm a glass half full person for, for several reasons. So firstly, I think within the next five years, there are going to be several gene therapy trials that will come to fruition and um, I hope will we'll, we'll show positive results for, for that subgroup of patients. Secondly, I think some of the university academic labs, and we've heard um, some detail about this from several of the presentations, we can now um, model to a certain extent motor neuron disease in a dish and we can screen lots of drugs and potential therapeutic approaches. Thirdly, I think pharmaceutical companies have changed. So they're very interested in motor neuron disease. Um, it, the market size isn't huge for them, but if we could do for MND what we can do for multiple sclerosis, the market size would hugely increase. And there's great interest now. There's been a sort of resurgence of interest 
from pharma companies in neurological diseases and their linking with academic departments and developing partnerships um, in a way that didn't really happen before. Mm -hmm. And if you're doing all the bioscience within a pharma company and you don't get a quick result, they kill that program and move on to something else. But the academic labs don't keep give up, they keep going. And, and pharma are, are linking, I think, uh, in a very positive way with the academic laboratories now. So for three yes. reasons, I'm optimistic that we will have made some progress in the next five years. Thank you. Brian? Um, I'll come at it from a slightly different perspective, um, working for a research funding agency as well as a patient association. Um, and, you know, in the past, um, drug companies who were running clinical trials used to th kind of think on the patient associations as a bit of an afterthought. They'd start running their big trial and they'd think, oh, maybe we should start talking to some of the patients. Um, now I find they're coming to us at a much earlier stage. In fact, they're coming to us before they've even got to the early stage clinical trials. And I think that's uh, a great, um, you know, it, it's a great sign that they're showing so much interest, but also the fact that it allows us to signpost them in the direction of experts like Professor Hardiman, Professor Shaw, who, can, who are absolutely fundamental to key parts of the drug development process. Um, a few years back, we co-funded a lectureship in PAMS Institute, um, and it was specifically for drug development purposes. And every time I read the annual report from this uh, scientist, it puts a smile on my face because he just has drug companies beating a path to his door. Um, so, you know, I can see, my, my vision is that we have a conveyor belt. We have a conveyor belt of ideas that are coming out the lab that run down towards and being turned into drugs that can be tested in the clinic. And what I've been seeing over the past 10 years is this conveyor belt starting to crank up and we're starting to deliver a series of things that will get to the clinic. And we haven't been very successful in developing those effective treatments to date, but, you know, some of them are going to work at some point. Thank you. Arpan, I think the conveyor belt is moving in your direction here. Um, um, so I, I'd like to make a few points. First of all, I think it, 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 coming to events like this me, mean that you sort of realise that you, you, you mustn't give, give up, and uh, um, it's very important for res junior researchers like myself. I think we're reaching a critical mass of um, ideas and um, findings, and I think um, one of the exciting things, I think, in the next five years, we're bringing them all together through collaboration, and we, we've heard some um, uh, e examples of that here, here in, in Europe with the NCALS consortium. Um, and I think, um, yeah, I think the, the the next five years are about accelerating everyone, you know, putting everyone's views together, and coming up with a multi-pronged attack to uh, to uh, alleviate this disease. Thank you. Orla? So uh, I, I'm very optimistic. So I think we have um, um, a perfect storm in a way. So we have pharma interest uh, for, for reasons that are around often drug and patents, and they're, they've moved from blockbuster drugs into um, rare diseases, and all of the companies have done that now. And so that's very good for a disease like motor neuron disease because it's a kind of, from their point of view, it's a prototype. If we can find some ways of slowing down or arresting motor neuron disease, it'll help with other diseases like MS and Parkinson's disease. That's the first thing. So pharma is interested. Uh, the second thing is that um, we, we're beginning to develop the technologies where we can uh, look at new drugs in a really fast way um, in, in the laboratory with, with the iPS cells. So, so we, can, we can do much more, much cleverer and smarter and cheaper ways of screening new drugs. But I think the biggest thing of all, and the mistake that we made in the 10 years, um, up to about three years ago, um, was that we recognised what a mess we've made of clinical trials. And I think the next five years is going to be fixing that mess. And I think that we'll be much cleverer about the way we design clinical trials. They'll be, they'll be cheaper and smarter and um, more inclusive. So in the five years, that, that uh, in the next five years, I see um, motor neuron disease being divided into uh, constituent subgroups. Not all of them. We won't have fixed all of them. Uh, we'll, we'll definitely have treatments for some of the genetic forms. 
Uh, we'll have much better outcome measures. We won't be constrained by the LS, FRS slope and vital capacity and survival. Uh, we will have other things that we can measure. The, the work that Brian is funding, the work that others are doing in biomarkers, both for diagnosis and also to look at, uh, at disease progression and also to look at whether the drug is getting to where it should be and whether it's affecting what we think it's affecting. So I think we'll have imaging tools, we'll have neuroelectric brainwave um, uh, uh, electric signaling tools, we'll have um, something called PET scanning tools, um, we'll have a lot more technology. Um, so we'll, we'll also be able to get people um, at different stages of their disease into trials. It won't be just 6%. It'll be 6% of people who can't get into trials, and we'll have 94% of people who'll be able to get into trials. That, I, I, that's what I think. That's my vision, but I think, we can, I think we can make it happen. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a really good question in which to wrap up uh, the discussion. And I've just got a few um, brief uh, closing uh, remarks. Um, uh, I recognise their hands raised right across the hall and another three questions at least uh, from further afield. So I hope that, that, that you'll recognise there are mechanisms for you to pursue these questions uh, through the um, patient interest groups, uh, perhaps uh, uh, as Brian was suggesting, offline once the formal session finishes. Um, so uh, please uh, take your questions uh, forwards. So um, uh, thanks for uh, all your interest and uh, participation. Uh, first I'd, I'd like to specifically acknowledge uh, Craig Stockton, his uh, team at uh, MND Scotland, and indeed the International Alliance for coordinating this event. Thanks to everyone in the hall for uh, managing the, the session, the IT and, and so on, the uh, external links. Um, particular thanks to everyone in the audience uh, for your attention, your participation. Uh, we were dependent on your reaction, your feedback, and your questions um, uh, to make the session a success. And, and clearly, uh, by that measure, it has been uh, a resounding success. So, uh, and lastly, I'd like just to take uh, the opportunity to thank once again our uh, experts uh, for giving their, their time, their knowledge and their experience for our uh, benefit. I hope there was something for everyone uh, this afternoon. I've certainly gained a huge amount myself and I hope uh, the same is true uh, for uh, each one of you. So perhaps you could show your appreciation in the usual manner. Thank you very much. <laughs>